Good morning and welcome to worship on this third Sunday in Pentecost. I want to give you all thanks for the opportunity that we had, Joy and Larissa and Marley and I, to get away for a week up and visiting the boys in Bellingham, celebrating Joy's birthday. Um, she's now officially two years older than me for a couple of months, so I always like to remind everybody of that. Um, we have uh, the opportunity to, I want to thank the folks who attended the Senate Assembly yesterday. Uh, Senate Assembly, Heather Burgett and Cindy Berkland and Keith Haney were our delegates in addition to myself uh, attending the uh, Senate Assembly, which was done virtually. Uh, 290 some people were registered for that and uh, all doing that on Zoom. And I'm recording this before it happens, so uh, I'll report back at a later time about kind of how all that went, but we're glad for that. I invite you to um, I invite you to now prepare yourselves for worship with a time of prayer and reflection during the prelude. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. O God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We return to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us the life of the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy, and you are forgiven and loved unto eternal life. Amen. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, you are the tree of life, offering shelter to all the world. Graft us into yourself and nurture our growth, that we may bear your truth and your love to those in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. from Ezekiel, the 17th chapter. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will take a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. I will set it out. I will break off a tender one from the topmost of its young twigs. I myself will plant it on a high and lofty mountain. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am the Lord. I bring low the high tree, I make high the low tree. I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will accomplish it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah. 
It is a good thing to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, on the psaltery and on the lyre, and to the melody of the harp. For you have made me glad by your acts, O Lord, and I shout for joy because of the works of your hands. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, and shall spread abroad like a cedar of Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be green and succulent, that they may show how upright the Lord is, my rock in whom there is no injustice. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the fourth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And yet, when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Well, I suppose it goes without saying that America is obsessed with size you know, with bigness, with large quantities and huge selections of almost everything. Now, most of our Minnesota friends have already fled to the north by now, but you don't have to be from Minnesota to know about the Mall of America. People from all over the country make what could be described as a pilgrimage to the Mall of America. It has over 520 stores, employs more than 12,000 people, and attracts up to 40 million shoppers per year who spend about $2 billion. The mall hosts more than 400 events a year, ranging from concerts to celebrity appearances and fashion shows. Now this makes the Mall of America one of the most popular destinations in the country, receiving more visitors per year than Disney World, Graceland, and the Grand Canyon combined. Why? Is it because there is merchandise available there that cannot be found anywhere else? Is stuff cheaper there? No, but the Mall of America is the biggest, the biggest in the country, and everyone knows that bigger is better. If you can put the prefix mega in front of something, it's a good bet that it's going to be hot. Mega store, megaplex, mega mall, mega channels, and yes, mega church. All such monikers flag places that people assume they should check out because if they're that big, they must be successful, and if they are successful, then they must be the best at whatever it is that they do. This mentality infects our thinking so much 
that we end up feeling sorry for small businesses, small churches, for those who only can afford a modest-sized vehicle or the cracker box little house, the tiny one-quarter carat diamond engagement ring. Hence, the focus of our business and also of churches is growth. Now, I'm not saying that growth is a bad thing. Uh, growth is a good thing. But how does a church grow? And what is it that God would have us grow to be? If you gather together all of the parables of Jesus that had to do with the kingdom of God, generally speaking, what you will discover are words to the effect that the kingdom, though the grandest thing of all, the boldest thing, the brightest reality of all, will nine times out of ten look small or unexpected. The kingdom of God is over and over again, that small thing that all but gets lost in the hubbub of the wider world. The kingdom is not advertised on some glitzy neon sign towering over Times Square, but rather it's the treasure buried in a field. It's not an expensive jewel displayed under plate glass and the bright lights at Saks Fifth Avenue, but it's the pearl of great price that someone just happens to stumble upon in some unlikely place. The kingdom does not call attention to itself like a marching band coming down the street with brass and drums blaring. But instead, it's like the yeast that disappears into a, a large lump of dough, the tiniest of all seeds that vanishes into the soil the very moment it's planted. In the two parables in our gospel lesson for today, Jesus points to the mystery of the kingdom. It's like a farmer who tosses a seed out into a field and walks away. He sleeps and yet he gets up and days come and, and, and days go. But somehow, even as the farmer is doing apparently nothing, the seeds grow. In verse 28, it says that the earth produces of itself. In the NIV, it says all by itself. The soil produces fruit. The Greek that this word comes from is automate, which, of course, we get our word automatic. So automatically, mysteriously, without any apparent outside assistance, the seeds just grow. And suddenly the day arrives when you've got a whole field of wheat ready to be harvested. Now, this is not meant to foster inactivity on our part. I mean, we don't walk away from the fourth chapter of Mark singing, que sera, que sera, whatever will be, will be. Just because the word automatic gets used here doesn't mean that we are called to do nothing to advance the kingdom. Still, it's an odd little story, which seems to want us to understand that the kingdom of God is breaking in. With or without our effort, it's going to happen. Our effort is not the main thing. God is the main thing. The kingdom itself is the main thing. It's a reminder to always make the main thing the main thing. If the growing seed parable seems to be about the mystery of the kingdom's growth, then the mustard seed image in the second parable is about the apparent weakness of the kingdom. The day will come when the results of the kingdom's silent, steady growth will be very impressive. But meanwhile, don't be surprised if the seeds that you plant seem to be ineffective. Don't be surprised if the witness you have, the witness that you have to offer gets laughed on, laughed at because on account of how puny it is. It's the old Jack and the Beanstalk story. You remember Jack's mother scorns these tiny beans that he brings home from the market. They can't live on those, so she turls them out the window in anger. And those beans were just a non-starter. They were a mistake. They were a dead end nutritionally and in every other sense, except that, of course, they ended up sprouting into a beanstalk that went way, way clear up to heaven, you might say. 
But Jesus says the gospel message will get a similar reception. We live in a universe and in a world with huge threats to existence and with sickeningly large social and geopolitical problems. There are meteors hurling through space, many of which would wipe out the earth if they struck us. In the Middle East, but in many other places too, including right here at home, there are seemingly intractable hatreds and prejudices between and among various ethnic groups. Do we really think that COVID will be the last disease to gallop across the world, threatening to wipe out the better part of an entire generation of people? Hunger, poverty, loom up like a whole mountain range of problems who weighs heights we don't even begin to grasp or understand. And they've been there forever. Yet in the midst of all of these threats from within and from without, in the face of, of great sin and, and great evil, faced with maladies that are global in scope, we Christians, we swing in with no more than the simplest of all messages. Jesus saves. A Jewish carpenter's son from halfway around the world and from over 2,000 years ago is the one we hold up as some kind of solution. And not a few folks today want to say, come on, give me a break. To so much of our size-crazed culture, the gospel is too small for the task at hand. In the face of untold millions of starving people, we seem to just offer five loaves and two fishes. In the face of a multi-trillion dollar federal and international debt, we seem to celebrate the widow's penny going into the collection plate. In the face of hostile terrorists and repressive regimes headed by the hounds of hell itself, we dispatch lamb-like folks to China and the Sudan and Afghanistan as missionaries witnessing to the lamb who was slain. None of it seems equal to the task of reaching, much less changing, this sorry and troubled old world. Why should the church remain content with the sheer simplicity of our message? Why should we stick to the belief that faith and love and justice and mercy and grace really do come by hearing that simple message of Jesus? We persist with our plain spoken witness to God's simple gospel, because we believe that somehow, some way, it is working. It is going to continue to work. Why? Because God said so. If we yoke these two parables in Mark, we can see both the theme of how puny our efforts look and also our ardent faith that even though we don't understand how the kingdom seeds grow, they do grow. They grow silently and mysteriously in people's hearts. The Jesus whose kingdoms we present invites with gentle words, Come, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I, I will give you rest. But people don't want quiet invitations to rest. They want powerful and inspirational promises of success. But our Lord himself said that this is not how the kingdom works. We know this but we have a hard time holding on to that message in this society, this world in which we live. We are tempted to try to supersize the gospel. But Mark 4 claims 
that the simple gospel that Jesus is the Son of God, who saves us by his death and resurrection, and that the only fitting response to that loving act is to live lives in service to God, in service to one another. We believe that's enough. In fact, we believe that it's more than enough. The gospel work that we, each of us and all of us together, undertake may look like a handful of small seeds in a huge desolate place. But our words and our actions in service to God and in service to others, though they may not seem to be making a difference, carry all of the power of God within them. And the Holy Spirit is in the soil. We proclaim that God is in the world. And that, that, my friends, makes all the difference. Amen. Let us confess our faith together now in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he arose again, he has set it into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before the triune God in prayer. Holy God, you plant the seeds of faith in every nation. Enliven your church so that the good news of your grace may root and grow throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator, even the trees, the shrubs, and the flowers delight in your goodness. From the depths of the soil to the highest mountains, bring forth new plants. Restore growth to places suffering drought. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Judge of nations, we pray for our leaders and those in power. Grant them the ability to regard those under their charge with humility, dedicating their lives in service to others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Divine Comforter, you show compassion to those in need and provide relief to those who call on you. Bless all who suffer, especially people trapped in cycles of poverty and homelessness. Bring healing and comfort to all who are in need. Hear our prayers, Lord, especially for those in our midst in need of your care. We pray for Rich, Dick, Steve, Bud, for Anne, Kate, Catherine, Charles, Ken, Catherine, Stu, Michael and Ryan, George, Jaron, Tom, Tony, Patsy, and Stacy. Terry, Robert, Larry, Jean, June, Kirsten, Scott, Susan, Don, Glenn, Michael and Teresa, Jory and Hester, Mike. For Kirsten and Lois, Steve, Paul, George, Sheila, Larry, Amanda, Rick, Kathy, Joe, Ellen, Randy, Paul, Tom, Debbie, Mary, Ellen, John. Monica, Joel, Jeff, Ollie, Stephanie, Brett, Mary Lou, Rod, Mary Sue, Judy, Scott, Ron, Joel, Ruth, Jean, Donna, and Jean. And all of those, Lord, whom we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sovereign God, this house of worship belongs to you. We give you thanks and pray for our church musicians, especially Mary Sue and Jill and Jane, Lincoln and Kirk. 
We dedicate to you the joyful noise that comes from this place, the melody of voice and instrument, and the songs from our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we give thanks for our ancestors in the faith who are now at home with you. We look forward to that day when we are reunited in your new creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your abiding grace. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we remember the Lord's death until he comes again. Pray together in the words which our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we have ever asked. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. The blessing
blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.